Cambodia just had a major election, but there wasn't much suspense involved. The outcome, as expected, was declared a win for authoritarian Prime Minister Hun Sen, who has been in power for over 33 years. This was the sixth general election since the UN sponsored the country's free and fair vote in 1993. But some analysts say that the more elections that have been held, the more authoritarian the country has become. Journalists and human rights groups say Cambodia is sliding into a full-fledged dictatorship. And we spoke to an expert on authoritarian regimes and democratization in Southeast Asia, who says the country is already there. Hi guys, I'm Versha. This is Now This World, and on this episode, we're exploring the question, how did Cambodia get here? Before we look at the latest elections, we need to understand who Hun Sen is. The world's longest currently serving prime minister first came to power in 1985, but was a political figure in the country years before that. A series of twists and turns in the Cambodian power structure eventually landed him in the right place at the right time. In the early 70s, a young Hun Sen joined the forces of the communist insurgency movement, the Khmer Rouge, and quickly moved up the ranks to commander, leading hundreds and thousands of men in military offenses against the pro-U.S. Khmer Republic in the years leading up to the Khmer Rouge's takeover of the capital city, Phnom Penh. Cambodia then spent four years in the mid-70s, embroiled in the Khmer Rouge regime, whose brutal crackdowns resulted in the deaths of an estimated two million people, including hundreds of thousands of mostly Muslim Cham people. This is considered to be one of the worst mass killings of the 20th century. Hun Sen has denied taking part in the human rights abuses committed by the Khmer Rouge. He defected to Vietnam in 1977, allegedly out of fear of retribution from the government for not taking part in the mass killings. Vietnam invaded Cambodia two years later, overthrew the Khmer Rouge regime, and instituted a new government, the People's Republic of Kampuchea, or PRK. Hun Sen's connection and perceived loyalty to Vietnam led to his appointment as foreign minister in the PRK, and then, by age 32, prime minister. But under the police state of the communist PRK, human rights abuses continued. Security forces suppressed opposition groups and tortured and interrogated detainees. Lee Morgan Besser, whose research examines flawed elections and dictators in Southeast Asia, broke it down for us. You had four warring factions. You had uh, outbreak of disease, poverty, starvation, sort of a lot of t very terrible conditions. Eventually, the international community stepped in to oversee a peace agreement with the goal of setting Cambodia on a path to democracy. This led to the 1993 so-called free and fair elections. Those elections didn't turn out so well for Hun Sen. His party, the Cambodian People's Party, or CPP, didn't win the majority of seats. But he refused to accept the result and forced a negotiation with the Hun Sen Pek Party to become second prime minister. In 1997, he orchestrated a coup to consolidate power and has single-handedly ruled as PM ever since. His official title in Khmer translates to princely exalted supreme great commander of gloriously victorious troops. And starting in 2016, all media were ordered to use this full title. As it stands, Transparency International ranks Cambodia the third most corrupt country in Asia. But how could a country with constitution mandated general elections every five years be so corrupt? It has a lot to do with who's running in them. Though no fewer than 20 registered parties competed in the recent election, it wasn't really a competition. Hun Sen has denied this, but these parties are known locally as firefly parties for a reason. They pop up briefly during election season, then fade away again. Many of these parties have been accused of ties to the government, or even being completely fabricated. Besides which, they have no time to develop infrastructure to mobilize supporters. You've got a, a party that's been in power since 1979, competing against 20 minor parties that have no significance, no influence on the political dynamics of the country. Most of them don't even have a national presence. They promote the idea of competition without the substance of it. He says the government is still using elections to uphold the facade of democracy, to help Cambodia make a case for foreign aid, foreign direct investment, and membership in international organizations. 
But Hun Sen's party essentially eliminated the only real opposition in November 2017 and imprisoned or exiled its leaders. Many speculate that the party's surprising success in the 2013 election was the driving force behind this. But even if these Firefly parties were well established with adequate resources, the actual process of voting still looks like this. Widespread irregularities with the elections, such as vote by and voter intimidation, literally handing out the cash, uh, literally teaching people how to tick the box to the Cambodian People's Party. Even if opposition groups exist, it's difficult for them to speak out without fear of retribution. A recently enacted Les Majeste law forbids people from insulting the monarchy or risk facing a fine and years of prison time. And pressure from international bodies isn't as strong as it has been historically. Though the White House has recently reduced its financial assistance to Cambodia over concerns about, quote, setbacks to democracy, the current stakes aren't too high for the country. You have China backing uh, Cambodia and the government and its approach to elections, and you have Donald Trump uh, in the White House, who, quite frankly, does not seem to care about the promotion of democracy and um, the security of human rights in Southeast Asia. And in the past year, the crackdown on human rights has escalated. In addition to eliminating the major opposition party, major independent newspapers have been forced to close in order to silence critical reporting. So now that the CPP has taken another victory, what's next for Hun Sen and the country? Hun Sen has committed to staying prime minister for at least another decade, and he's also been grooming his sons to take over when the time comes. But as the younger, more educated generation grows increasingly disillusioned with Hun Sen's authoritarian rule, could a mass protest reasonably overthrow the government?